Welcome back to the third talk of the morning, which is from Professor Andrei Skarinets. Andrei um, got his undergraduate degree at Moscow State University and then PhD at New York University, and then had postdocs and fellowships in the States at CERN in Canada and Southampton, and luckily for us ended up in 2008 at Oxford, where he's professor of physics in the Rudolf Pius Center and fellow of St. John's. Andre is from the particle physics group, um, and he's interested in the application of string theory to quantum field theories, and in particular in holography. And he's going to explain to us what holography is. So thanks, Andre. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me share the screen. And uh, hopefully. Uh, if you could just confirm it, if you yep. can, you can yep, that's fine. slide and okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you everybody for joining. So we'll talk a little bit uh, about uh, uh, slightly more exotic applications of hydrodynamics, which is fluid gravity duality and hydrodynamics of black holes. So here is the outline of the talk. We'll discuss a little bit uh, relativistic hydrodynamics, the foundations of this, of this subject, and then turn to black holes. I will remind you what black holes are as solutions of Einstein's general relativity. And uh, I will also remind you about black hole thermodynamics. Then we'll discuss what happens if you perturb black holes out of equilibrium. So out of equilibrium, they're described by a so-called black hole membrane paradigm. And I will discuss this in some detail. And then we will embed all of all this picture into the modern sort of uh, modern theoretical framework, which is known as holographic duality. So this will bring us to a discussion of whether or not Navier-Stokes equations can be recast within this holographic duality as Einstein's equations of general relativity close to the horizons of black holes. And we will finish by discussing some recent gravity-inspired new advances in relativistic hydrodynamics. So relativistic hydrodynamics is necessary when fluids and gases move with speeds which are comparable to the speed of light. And such situations are not so uncommon as Steve already mentioned in his talk. So first of, uh, of all, of course, we have multiple applications in uh, relativistic astrophysics, uh, in particular with accretion disks around black holes and stars and so on. But also here in Earth, if we have high energy cosmic rays, which are coming uh, to Earth and striking the ordinary matter, they produce zillions of particles and these particles behave hydrodynamically. And they are described, this behavior is described by relativistic hydrodynamics as was shown by Fermi and Landau in 1950s. You can also do artificial experiments here on Earth in accelerators such as RIC and LHC, as also Steve mentioned in his first talk. Uh, then you create the so-called quark-gluon plasma. And quark-gluon plasma is a quantum strongly interacting fluid. So it is described by relativistic hydrodynamics, but not by kinetic theory. So this is a rather, rather interesting object to study. So in the relativistic domain, we have new features. Again, Steve already mentioned this, but uh, let me mention this again. So energy, momentum, and mass are no longer separate quantities. They're tied together by formulas like this one, of which, of course, E is equal to mc squared is the simple limit, right? But uh, we also have momentum in the game in more general setting. And therefore, it makes sense to go to different variables. So do not consider density of mass alone, because mass can be converted to energy and vice versa but to consider instead energy density as a basic variable and momentum density. And as often happens in uh, special relativity, you have to recast all these objects into four dimensional language, into the language of Minkowski space time, where every object will have four components. So here you have the object, which is known as the energy momentum tensor in which we package these energy density and momentum density and uh, you have these indices A and B running from zero to three as appropriate in special relativity. Another point in the relativistic systems is that the number of particles is no longer conserved, right? For the same reason as this formula shows that you can, if you have enough energy, you can create zillions of particles out of vacuum particle antiparticle pairs. And so it doesn't make sense to talk about a conserved quantity, which is the number of particles. 
But we can have other conserved quantities in the game, such as baryonic charge and lepton charge, and they are really conserved. But they have to be written in four-dimensional language of special relativity. And uh, so the main hero here would be the density of conserved charge, for example, baryonic charge. And then the other components, the uh, components of the current Jx, Jy, and Jz, are tied together with this density of conserved charge in the conservation equation, which again in four-dimensional language can be simply written as a four divergence of this four current Ja. And conservation of energy and momentum is uh, uh, presented by the conservation of Tab in the following equation here. So these are the conservation laws in the relativistic domain. And these are the main uh, building blocks of hydrodynamics in the relativistic domain. So let me remind you again about foundations of hydrodynamics, right? So um, if you wait, so suppose you have a system relativistic or not of many, 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 many constituents. If you wait long enough, the system equilibrates. Hopefully, again, this is not a priori guaranteed, but in most systems, we observe the uh, equilibration if you wait long, long, uh, for a long, long time. Just before this equilibration, on very large scales of space, the system will be characterized by time and space dependent densities of conserved charges. Because in thermal equilibrium, when you wait for infinity, right, for eternity, it is characterized by globally conserved charges, just a handful of globally conserved charges in thermal equilibrium. So if you just make one step back in time before everything has equilibrated, you will see that these conserved charges acquire dependence on space and time. But still, there are just a handful of these conserved charges, right? But uh, these densities of conserved charges are the main fundamental degrees of freedom of hydrodynamic description, all right? So this is, this is the, the key, the key uh, assumption, if you want, because it's, sometimes it's very hard to derive hydrodynamic description from, uh, from fundamental principles such as Lagrangian and Hamiltonians. You can do it with kinetic theory, but not every fluid has a kinetic uh, description, of course, right? So this is, um, so let me add a little bit uh, <coughs> more uh, uh, to that. So we have fundamental degrees of freedom, which are densities of conserved charges. Now, what about equations of motion for these densities of conserved charges? So equations of motion come from conservation laws and the so-called constitutive relations. So let me explain this with a very simple example of a conservation of a charge. So suppose we have baryonic charge, right? Baryonic charge in four dimensions, the conservation law, as I mentioned earlier, is just a four divergence equal to zero. So this is a microscopic law which holds all this. Now, but in the hydrodynamic regime, so this JA here, right? It has four components, J naught, the density of charge, and then JX, JY, JZ, these are components of the current. But in the hydrodynamic regime, the only degree of freedom allowed is the density of conserved charge J naught. So we have to have another equation which would express components of the current through this fundamental degree of freedom, which is the density of conserved charge. How can we do this? This is done in effective theory as the infinite series, which is compatible with all symmetries of the system. So what happens? So here we have a simple first term which says that if you have a gradient of the density of charge, suppose the density of charge here is higher than here, then the current will flow. It will flow proportionally to a gradient, right? So with some coefficient of proportionality, which happens to be diffusion constant, all right? And then you can have more and more terms added with higher and higher gradients. So this is known as the gradient expansion. If you combine these two equations, you will get equations of motion in hydrodynamic regime, which in this case is nothing but the diffusion equation. With energy momentum tensor, it's a similar story. You have microscopic conservation law, and then you have constitutive relation, which is an infinite series in terms of gradients. More and more derivatives are added. So if you take term without truncate the series with terms only containing no derivatives at all and combined with conservation law, you will get what is known as relativistic Euler's equation. If you allow in this truncation, the first derivatives only, but no second derivatives and higher, and combined with this equation, you get Navier-Stokes relativistic Navier-Stokes equations. If you allow second order in derivatives, you get generalization of Navier-Stokes equations known as Barnett equation, and so on. So in principle, this is the, the way to build to build hydrodynamics in general. So this is a scary formula, but let me just, uh, just show it for a second. It shows this first term, which contains only first derivatives and nothing, nothing, nothing else. And uh, 
uh, what I would like to emphasize is that the derivative structure, so this complicated crocodile here, is completely universal. For any liquid or gas, it is absolutely universal. What is not universal is the set of these coefficients which multiply these tensor structures. These coefficients, eta, kappa, lambda, and so on, are known as transport coefficients. And they characterize the matter, the fluid, the theory at hand. So for each fluid, they are different. They have to be computed from the microscopic, underlying microscopic theory. And this is what differs, what, what makes, uh, for example, hydrodynamics of water different from hydrodynamics of quark-gluon plasma. All right, so one important coefficient there is shear viscosity. So shear viscosity can be understood as a measure of internal friction in a fluid or gas. So suppose you have two layers of fluid or gas moving with slightly different velocities. For example, top layer is a little bit faster than the lower one. Now, particles of both layers can penetrate uh, these layers uh, uh, from, from, from top to bottom and, and vice versa, right? They carry momentum. So this particle, for example, from the slow layer can penetrate this one, right? And it will carry a horizontal momentum of this, which will slow down the upper layer. And likewise, the particle from the upper layer can penetrate the lower layer and it will speed it up because it will carry some momentum of it. So viscosity is a measure of how much this transferred momentum is actually transferred by this, by this motion of particles. So this is internal friction. It's no different from when you, when you have your palms, right, and doing like this, right, you feel heat. So this is internal friction, no different from what is happening here. And viscosity is a measure, quantitative measure of this internal friction. So now we let us abandon, abandon relativistic aerodynamics for, for a while, for a while, we come back to it, and go to gravity and black holes. So general relativity is a theory of classical gravity, classical meaning not quantum. Einstein's equation determine the metric of space and time. And these equations philosophically, so I've written here, and philosophically they encode the following situation, that if you have on the right-hand side distribution of mass and energy encoded in energy momentum tensor, then uh, you can determine the geometry of space-time by solving this equation because on the left-hand side, you have objects such as the metric, Riemann tensor, and so on, uh, which encode geometry of space-time. So uh, you have to solve these equations in order to determine the metric of space-time given the distribution of masses uh, and energy in space and time. All right, so this is, uh, this is what Einstein's equations are doing. Now, this is similar to Maxwell's equations where you have also left-hand side and right-hand side. On the right-hand side, you have distribution of charges and currents in space and time. And on the left-hand side, you have electric and magnetic field encoded in this four potential A mu. So if you have, if you know distribution of charges and uh, currents in space and time, then you can compute electric and magnetic fields produced by them. So this is philosophically similar. Now, <clears throat> the main hero in Einstein's equations is of course the metric tensor. And let me remind you what it is, right? So we have, for example, uh, Pythagoras theorem in two dimensions, uh, flat space in two dimensions, then this Pythagoras theorem tells us how to compute infinitesimal distance between points, let's say, B and C. Just use this. This can be written more generally because this is a quadratic form uh, which, can, uh, which has dx squared and dy squared, but no cross term dx dy. More generally, you can write down the uh, distance between two points in more general space, for example, curved space on a sphere, let's say, where you do have off diagonal terms. And these off diagonal terms, g11, g12, g21, and so on, they are. Uh, uh, they can be written conveniently in the form of a matrix. A matrix with entries G11, G12, and so on. And these entries can also depend on space and time. So they can be local in space and time. In this simple example, right, we have a diagonal metric, a very, very simple uh, two by two matrix, which is just a unit matrix. But of course, it can be far more non trivial with these components depending on X and time. So an example of uh, flat Minkowski space, of course, is a metric line element of which is given by this expression. And we have time here entering the game because this is special relativity with minus sign. This, if you want, this is the contents of special relativity in one line, right? So, and we have time uh, joining the spatial uh, uh, directions. And this is just a metric of ordinary Euclidean three-dimensional space written in spherical coordinates. Now let's consider solutions of Einstein's equations. So if on the right-hand side, we have a spherical distribution of mass, then the solution for the metric can be found, was found by Schwarzschild in 1916, and this solution is written here. 
So you can see that it describes the space time outside of a spherically symmetric distribution of mass m. So if you put m to zero here, you see that you'll go back to Minkowski, flat Minkowski space, uh, space time. Now, uh, uh, so uh, this metric uh, describes, uh, for example, to good approximation, the space time around spherical symmetric objects such as Earth, if you, if you model Earth by, by, a spherical, by a spherical symmetric body. Uh, now, what happens? <clears throat> so you may notice in this metric that you have this uh, dangerous uh, value of R of radius, then this term here uh, vanishes. And uh, here you have a singularity because you have zero in the denominator. So this is known as the Schwarzschild radius. Now, in most cases, Schwarzschild radius is completely harmless because, for example, for Earth, Schwarzschild radius is about one centimeter, right? So this expression doesn't apply inside the body. It only applies outside the body. So it's completely harmless. But if you have some powerful forces which take our Earth and squeeze it into the little ball of of radius which is less than one centimeter, then it matters, of course. In this case, you will get a black hole. So black holes are very interesting objects. You can have, of course, uh, neutral black holes like Schwarzschild one. You can add charge. So then you can have Reisner Nordstrom black hole. You see the metric generalizes. You have a charge here. And you can have rotating black holes. These are Kerr black holes, uh, rotated uh, charged black holes, uh, which are known as Kerr Newman black holes. So black holes. <coughs> have a number of very interesting properties, mostly related to behavior of the horizons. So <coughs> in particular, entropy and temperature can be associated with black holes. That was done in 1970s by Bekenstein, Hawking, and others. And uh, I refer you to a wonderful talk by John Choker in um, one of the Saturday mornings devoted to entropy, where he explains in full detail why it is reasonable to assign, um, to assign entropy to, 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 to a black hole. So uh, Hawking showed that uh, uh, black holes emit radiation at a quantum level, and therefore one can associate temperature to them. And moreover, um, so you can look at uh, expressions for a Schwarzschild black hole. Black hole. So for example, temp Hawking temperature will contain H bar here, right? And for example, for a solar mass black hole, this temperature is 50 nanokelvin. So it's very, very small. Now the entropy, on the other hand, is gigantic because it has H bar in the denominator. And uh, you, can, you can do a little exercise and compute uh, what's the entropy, for example, of a solar mass black hole. It's a gigantic number. Moreover, these people um, uh, like uh, Hawking, Bardeen, Carter, and others, they established that the laws of black hole mechanics are actually similar or, in fact, identical up to the definition of letters to the laws of black hole, or of, to the laws of ordinary thermodynamics. So, for example, there is a theorem which says that the horizon area is not decreasing function of time. But uh, we have second law of thermodynamics, which says that the entropy is a non-decreasing function of time. And uh, as Bekenstein suggested, entropy uh, and horizon are related by this formula right, of one quarter of horizon area. And therefore, um, uh, this resembles. So these laws of black hole mechanics, they, uh, they actually are the laws of black hole thermodynamics, equilibrium. So this is all equilibrium. That's fine. But um, now we would like to see what happens beyond beyond black hole thermodynamics, beyond equilibrium state. Now, um, uh, we can consider a, uh, an analogy, right? So, so suppose we have a normal system, a conducting sphere placed in an external electromagnetic field. So external electromagnetic field will disturb this sphere from equilibrium. It will induce surface currents on the sphere, right? And, and uh, these surface currents can be computed. This is a rather simple undergraduate problem, uh, problem in electromagnetism. You can compute the surface currents given the external field. And uh, you will see that they obey the Ohm's law, the current will proportional to external field with conductivity, which is, uh, which is the uh, coefficient of proportionality. Now, it's important to understand that we only use to solve this problem. We don't care about microscopic carriers of these charges in the sphere. We only care about Maxwell's equations uh, and also boundary conditions on the fields. So let's now do the same with black holes. Take a black hole and place it in an external electromagnetic field. That was done in the 70s by these people. And uh, then you can, uh, it's convenient to introduce the concept of so-called stretch horizon, which is a time-like surface just outside the usual Schwarzschild event horizon. So what was discovered was that if you do this, then a black hole or rather a stretch horizon also has induced currents, and they behave according to Ohm's law. And moreover, you can compute the conductivity sigma or resistance of the black hole. 
And it turns out that the resistance of black hole, so you combine, so basically you solve Maxwell's equations in curved space time close to the horizon. And what comes out is that a black hole can be viewed as an ohmic resistor, as an ohmic conductor with a surface resistance of 377 ohm per square. So this unit uh, is uh, typical for thin uh, foils, thin, thin films. You can compare with different uh, systems like metal foils or silicon, which have similar numbers. So this is rather exotic. You can do more. You can take a black hole and place it in an external gravitational wave. Right, what gravitational wave does to typical medium, right? So it passes through this medium, it distorts the medium, it creates strain and stresses, right? And therefore, it is a good laboratory to measure response of your body to, to this external influence. And response typically in terms of fluid uh, dynamics uh, quantities is given by uh, viscosities. So people computed shear and bulk viscosity of Schwarzschild black holes, and it is proportional to H bar, both of them. And uh, if people bothered at the time to divide shear viscosity by the entropy density, they would discover it that this ratio is equal to one over four pi in uh, Planck units. So we learned that black holes have properties of the physical medium, such as conductivity and viscosity. Well, this can be embedded in the holographic principle. Now, the holographic principle, so again, I emphasize that in gravitational systems, right, we have uh, entropy, which is proportional to the area, let's say, of a black hole horizon, not the volume of a black hole as it would be in the normal, for example, ideal gas, let's say, right, where it is proportional to volume. So this is manifestation of the um, uh, uh, holographic principle, which says that gravitational degrees of freedom in D dimensions are effectively is described by a non-gravitational theory in D minus one dimension. So uh, now I will give you a very brief introduction to string theory and gauge string duality and holography in one slide. So this slide is a picture which was used by Ludwig Wittgenstein in 1953 uh, in his uh, philosophical uh, discussions, but uh, we use it for gauge string duality. So you have an object which can be described in different languages. If you look at vertically, right, so this looks, this resembles a duck, right? So you describe this object as a duck. If you tilt your head and look at it from the left, you will see a rabbit. So you describe this object in terms of a rabbit, but it is the same object. And you cannot say it is rabbit or duck a priori, right? It depends on, on, on this point of view. So uh, there must be a dictionary between language of rabbit and language of duck, which describes the same object because the object is the same, right? So this dictionary between the two languages is called duality in general. And this applies also to holographic duality. In holographic duality in string theory, you have an object, a collection, non perturbative collection of, uh, of uh, black brains, and it can be described in two languages, rabbit or duck. It can be described as open string picture and closed string picture, right? And then um, uh, in language of open string picture or a language of closed string picture. And there is a quantitative, so this is not philosophy anymore, there is a quantitative dictionary between these two languages, which allow you to calculate quantitatively properties of this object in one language or the other language, depending on your convenience. Now, what is fundamentally important is that when one language, when one theory, one description is strongly coupled, so you don't know how to calculate, you cannot apply perturbation theory enough, everything fails. Then the other language is weakly coupled where you can happily calculate everything. So if you know the dictionary, you can, and you're interested in, for example, thermalization of the uh, system on the left, you can happily map it into the weakly coupled system and calculate every quantity you need, right? So that's, that's a wonderful holographic correspondence, which we will apply. So in particular, so you have black holes, which are dual to non-gravitational degrees of freedom. Now black holes, so every system in equilibrium, a typical system is characterized by its number of conserved charges and, um, we also know that if we perturb a non-gravitational uh, non system, such as a spring pendulum here from equilibrium, it will typically oscillate with some eigenfrequencies, normal modes. It will have a collection of normal modes. In this case, this normal mode is very simple here. So what happens to a black hole? If you perturb black hole out of equilibrium, well, we have, uh, what happens? Sorry, the black hole will oscillate. It will emit gravitational waves. So these are normal modes of black holes uh, known as the quasi-normal modes because they have non-zero imaginary part and non-zero imaginary part emerges because of the presence of the black hole horizon. So, well, we know, suppose we can compute very, e well, relatively easily, we can compute the spectrum, the quasi-normal spectrum of these black holes, but the holographic principle tells us 
that this is mapped one to one into non equilibrium properties of a dual non gravitational quantum field theory. So, in particular, there is a regime in this theory which is described by hydrodynamics. So, I mentioned this diffusion equations and so on and so forth. And this is quantitatively mapped into the spectra, into the quasi normal spectra of a dual black holes. Right? So, therefore, you can compute. So, for example, in the language of hydrodynamics, you have in your system, you have excitations such as sound waves. So, these are quasi particles in uh, every hydrodynamic system. You have sound. And you have dispersion relation for the sound, which is given by uh, this equation here. You have speed of sound, and then you have dumping of sound waves characterized by viscosity. So this is all mapped in holography into the eigenspectrum of black holes, of dual black holes. And here is the genuine calculation, right? So this expression is one of these eigenfrequencies of a five dimensional dual black hole, dual to this quantum field theory system. So you can just compare term by term and read off from a comparison of these two, um, uh, two expressions, for example, that the speed of sound, uh, speed of sound V is speed of light divided by square root of three. And then you can also read off the ratio of shear viscosity to entropy density by comparing these two terms. And the ratio of A to over S happens to be exactly as expected from these old considerations of 1970s. You can go beyond that and directly relate Navier-Stokes equations and Einstein's equations. And this is known as a fluid gravity correspondence. Now, <clears throat> more modern so uh, development of last years um, is concentrated on understanding the so-called unreasonable effectiveness of hydrodynamics, because it turned out by studying these systems. So it's a very effective tool to study systems which are strongly coupled and cannot be studied by normal means, such as kinetic theory and similar perturbative technique. So what it revealed is a very surprising fact that quite often, you can have hydrodynamics working perfectly well before local thermal equilibrium is established. So a new term was coined, which is hydronomization, not thermalization. So you don't wait until you have local thermal equilibrium. Your Navier-Stokes equations are perfectly fine. So it's an open area of research. So one of them is so shown here. Right? So for example, you want so you have a dispersion relation for the sound mode, as I mentioned on the previous slide. and. Uh, uh, suppose you want to understand the limits of limits of hydrodynamic description, namely when does this series converge and when it diverges, right? So this series, infinite series, right? So you want to find its radius of convergence. So you by mapping this to a dual black hole spectra, you can do it rather easily. To do this, you have to consider excitations of black holes at complex values of spatial momentum. And then you see uh, this is an interesting connection to the algebraic curves. Because you see the breakdown of perturbation theory happens, then uh, here in this region, you encounter a non hydrodynamic degree of freedom. And this, in algebraic curve sense, means that this algebraic curve opens up. You see this red star here, and uh, you have opening up of this algebraic curve. And this limits the, uh, limits the applicability of hydrodynamics. So the radius of convergence actually is finite, and you can actually compute it in a particular theory which has its gravity dual description which is quite, uh, quite a remarkable uh, thing, I believe. All right, you can also, <clears throat> you can also think of um, uh, how uh, the domain of applicability of hydrodynamic description depends on coupling, because you can have systems which are strongly interacting. You can have systems which are weakly interacting. So whether or not hydrodynamics applies uniformly throughout the coupling value, that's, that's, uh, that's a question, right? So in, in this uh, holographic, uh, with this holographic tools, you can uh, find the answer to this question. The answer is no, no, that, uh, that's not uniform. You can have dependence, you have dependence on the applicability of hydro, which varies with coupling. So it's actually, so hydro is more applicable according to this graph, you see. So hydro is more applicable in green domain when you have a strongly interacting system when uh, then, uh, then the, the uh, applicability region at weak coupling. So this is one of the uh, examples of how this holography helps generically to uh, understand the behavior of fluid dynamical systems. So let me come to <clears throat> let me come to conclusions. So uh, we have seen that black holes uh, have entropy and temperature and in equilibrium they behave like thermodynamic systems and we think we understand why because of this holographic principle it simply means that we know what the microscopic degrees of freedom are which equilibrate right these are microscopic degrees of freedom uh, expressed in this language of non gravitational theory dual to a particular black hole 
Now, out of equilibrium, horizons of black holes exhibit fluid-like properties, which were described by membrane paradigm in 1970s and 1980s. But now, the work on black hole physics has led to this discovery of gauge string duality or holography or idea safety correspondence or rabbit duck duality, let me call it like that. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, black hole thermodynamics and membrane paradigm, therefore, are now fully embedded into this modern language of holographic picture. Now, we also talked about eigenmodes of black holes. And um, uh, we know that they used very extensively. So this is very active area of uh, uh, research to study thermalization and discover new phenomena such as hydronomization and hydrodynamic attractors and all this, uh, this stuff. It's, it's, really, it's really quite fascinating because uh, holography, so sometimes you may think of this uh, string theory holography uh, calculations as completely abstract and kind of out of touch of real life and so on. But um, uh, at least one good use of this uh, is that um, of this is, is that it inspired new research into fundamentals of fluid dynamics. So you might have thought that all oh, fluid dynamics is oil or it's, it's 18th century, 19th century Navier stocks, and everything is known there. It's not the case. So fundamentals. So people who are who are doing this uh, these uh, these uh, uh, this research in in holography and so on, they are actually looking at fundamentals of very basics of, of formulation of hydrodynamics of applicability range of how to theoretically uh, establish this. So uh, inspired by holography, uh, relativistic hydrodynamics has been recently rewritten to deal with problem of causality. This is one 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 simple example with possible applications in astrophysics. So this was this was done really in, in uh, essentially last year to full, to full extent. So let me finish with one, um, one remark. So in, uh, in, uh, in the Soviet Union and in, uh, in uh, Russia, uh, among physicists, there was this uh, brutal criterion. It's a bit of a joke, of course, but, but still um, a brutal criterion of um, uh, when a work of a physicist is, is actually, uh, is, is actually uh, meaningful. And the criterion is the following. If in your life's work, you manage to add at least one line to the Landau Lifshitz 10 volume terms of uh, the 10 volumes of uh, um, the course of theoretical physics, or maybe change one equation there, then, then, then it, is, uh, it, is, uh, it is something meaningful. You, you have done at least something, right? So uh, let me just finish with saying that what is happening now in foundational uh, uh, foundations of fluid dynamics is very much of this caliber because certain things in Landau Lifshitz volume six will have to be amended because of this work. And I'm quite happy to, uh, to report this, at least in philosophical terms. Thank you very much. I will uh, pause for questions. Thanks, Andre. Can you unshare your screen? Uh, yes. Hi, thank you. Great, so we've got some questions for you. First of all, in terms of recommending a book, Neil Smith asks, can you recommend a book primer? Um, so people can learn more about this. Uh, yes, uh, I just um, uh, so the, the book uh, the book on holography or the book on um, so uh, yes uh, there are actually so if we're talking about uh, this specific um, applications of holography to hydrodynamics uh, there is a book um, uh, which actually one of the offers so it's a it's a, it's a collection of offers. And one of them was actually a Royal Society fellow here in Oxford, uh, Jorge Casaldere Salana. Now he's a faculty in Barcelona. Uh, so I will, it's probably easier for me to, to write in chat the exact, uh, uh, the exact title and uh, everything uh, as a reference we have. Right? But yes, uh, I, can, I can recommend some, yes. Right. So Professor Taylor has recognized the 377 ohms as the impedance of free space. So why did we end up with that number and what does the black hole contribute? Uh, uh, I don't know. So uh, uh, it's, um, uh, um, I mean, the, the, the 377 is the outcome of the, of the equations, right? The, the meaning of this is not entirely clear because um, uh, I didn't mention this, but uh, so I said that it is embedded into, uh, into holography and kind of it's, it's understood why we have these properties. But uh, there is one subtlety here that uh, 377 um, comes for Schwarzschild's black holes, which are asymptotically flat. And for Schwarzschild black holes in asymptotically flat space, we don't have 
a holographic description. You might have noticed that bulk viscosity of the uh, Schwarzschild black hole is negative. So typically, this is, uh, this is a sign that your system is unstable. And indeed, uh, uh, ordinary Schwarzschild black hole in asymptotically flat space is unstable due to Hawking radiation, right? So it has negative specific heat also, right? So this is, for this system, we don't have a holographic description in terms of a stable quantum field theory. And uh, so um, this 377, um, at least at the moment, it's not entirely uh, clear you know, what, uh, what meaning you could, uh, you, could, you could assign to this. However, the ratio of shear viscosity to entropy density happens to be universal for all horizons of all black holes. So this is a universality statement, which is extremely powerful. So in particular, regardless of whether or not you, you have a symptotically flat black hole or asymptotically ADS black hole, it doesn't matter. So this ratio stands, uh, states to be one over five. Right. So Stephen Burke asks, does the black hole duality have any consequences to things we can observe about actual black holes? Um, uh, probably not, uh, except that, uh, so because, uh, uh, so these are not astrophysical, astrophysical objects. So like uh, I mentioned, I, uh, the Hawking temperature, for example, is in, uh, typically is in nano Kelvin. So it's not something that you could easily, easily observe. Now, what may happen is that for, uh, so this uh, uh, duality, the holographic considerations, uh, apart from clarifying the fundamentals of hydrodynamics per se, they can also uh, help with understanding primordial uh, black holes and uh, behavior of, uh, of, uh, of the universe right after the Big Bang, because uh, there it's quite likely that gravity uh, is uh, actually contains a number of terms beyond Einstein Hilbert gravity. And uh, by uh, using this technique, you can actually uh, maybe predict something about the spectrum of gravitational primordial gravitational waves, but this is for the future because, of course, at the moment we cannot we cannot detect primordial gravitational waves. But. Yeah, and and we'll take uh, the second question from Chun Kit Law next. So, so can you explain what exactly you mean by the spectrum of a black hole? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. So, so the spectrum of black hole is um, uh, uh, philosophically is no different from. Uh, uh, eigenmodes, the normal modes of any, let's say, mechanical system, right? So I have I have a system here, right? So this this, this system has the system has a number of eigenmodes, which in principle you can you can calculate uh, via classical mechanics, right? So so black holes are classical objects apart from Hawking radiation. So they are solutions of classical theory of gravity, Einstein's theory of gravity, and what you can do, like with any other object. You take equilibrium values, for example, solution, equilibrium solution to Einstein's equations, and you perturb it a little bit. So you have metric G minu, and then you have a small fluctuation plus delta G minu. And you solve Einstein's equations, you linear, linearize them, and you find the spectrum of linearized Einstein's equations. Right? So this becomes a, a boundary value problem similar to classical mathematical physics of 19th century, except that it is non-Hermitian because of the presence of the horizon. Right, so these are classical eigenmodes, pretty much like in this in this thing. Right. So then, um, Jonathan Edge asks: Is there an intuitive picture for how a hydrodynamic description can work without local thermalization? Is it just because the system is so strongly coupled that you can still get collective behavior without the thermalization? Uh, yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, the honest answer to this is uh, we don't know at the moment. In fact, as I mentioned, this is a pretty, pretty active area of research. What people discovered, so you see, in, no in normal systems, usually it's very hard to detect how the system actually thermalizes if you don't have perturbative access to the degrees of freedom which cause this, this thermalization, all right? Now, in holographic systems, we are blessed with this dictionary, so we can actually access this and see how the system. So what happens? So so basically, you take uh, you take a local a local um, uh, local density. So take this uh, energy momentum tensor components, right? Which in equilibrium, for example, component T naught naught T zero zero becomes uh, equilibrium uh, energy density. But long before equilibrium happened, and I'm not even talking global equilibrium, but local equilibrium, long before that. This same quantity, you can write down equations of motion for this, 
right? In kinetic theory, if you were able to solve the Bogolubov chain, completely BBGKY chain, then would be the analog, right? In holography, with help of gravity, you can do it rather easily, or you can put it on a computer, it's rather easy to, easy to simulate. So what people discovered, and that, that was discovered over the last five years. So, so they discovered that uh, in these, within these degrees of freedom, you have so-called hydrodynamic attractors. So all behavior, regardless of initial conditions when you start with, uh, which you start with, you have trajectories attracted to one curve in dynamical space, in the phase space. And this curve is stable, right? The attractor by definition is something where, you know, which is, which is, which is extremely robust. So this attractor is the answer. It's not maybe intuitive answer, right? But it, it is the best answer we have at the moment of why hydrodynamic hydrodynamization or hydrodynamic uh, 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 behavior happens even before local equilibrium. It definitely happens after local equilibrium, that's for sure. But the surprise was that it actually happens before. And th this is an active, active area of research. And so one last question, Andre. Alexis Hughes asks, could this work on black holes give us, could the work on black holes give us any hints on what settings to put into the particle accelerator that we heard about earlier? Yes, definitely. Uh, in fact, uh, one of them uh, is, is used very extensively for the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And this is the ratio of shear viscosity to entropy density. So um, uh, for QCD, we don't have a, a holographic dual, but we do have holographic duals for systems which are quite similar to QCD in terms of hydrodynamic behavior. And uh, about 20 years ago, uh, via holography, the ratio of shear viscosity to entropy density was computed, and it was established that it was universal for all systems which have these gravity duals. So what community, heavy ion community working, working on these matters, what they're using now as a benchmark for all these simulations of non-gas talks and heavy ion collisions is the value given by holography, h bar over 4 pi k Boltzmann. This is a standard entry, which is, uh, which, is, uh, which is already used. And there are other examples, but this is probably the most prominent one. Good, thank you. If people have further questions, they can ask them to the speakers in the breakout rooms, because we hope you will now join us in the breakout rooms. The way this works is that there's a new URL, which is in the email Michelle sent you, and which I've also put into the chat. So you need to log on to that new Zoom place, and then you can hopefully move yourself into the right room. When you arrive, you should see a breakout room icon on the list of icons at the bottom. And this is a thing with four squares. If you click on that, you'll get a list of rooms and who's in them, and you can join the one you want. And Michelle and I will be around to, to try and rescue anybody who's lost in cyberspace. It would be great if you could stick to about six people in each room so we don't get overcrowding anywhere. So what remains to me is to say thank you very much to the speakers this morning, to Steve and Bruno and Andre, who've taken a great deal of time, first of all, to find jackets and ties for the first time for about six months, and of course, to prepare these, these talks. Um, it's, it's, it's hard giving talks on Zoom. Uh, and it was great and interesting. And thank you very much, Steve, Bruno and, and Andre. I also want to say thank you very much to Michelle Boscher, to Michelle who's put all this together and has done all the emailing and has worked out uh, how the Zoom works and things like that and got us all organized. Thank you, Michelle. So I'll sign off now. Thank you very much for joining us and hope to see you in a minute uh, in these breakout rooms. Goodbye. <laughs>